Well, all right, guys, I'm so glad you're here for this video. And we've now transitioned from the spiritual war and the schemes of Satan to the armor God has provided to stand against those schemes. And let's begin by reading our verses, Ephesians 6, 10 through 14. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Well, all right, let's just do a quick review so we're back up to speed again. Ephesians 6 gives us an outline of the believer's warfare. And here we see we are not called to a life of spiritual ease and comfort. We are called to a war against ruthless enemies. So to stand in this fight against those enemies, we must fight in God's power and not our own. And we must put on the armor he has provided. Then last week, we started to look at that armor. And the first piece is found in Ephesians 6.14. Ephesians 6.14 again, Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth. The New King James Version puts it this way, Stand therefore having girded your waist with truth. And we use that. And we saw that girding dealt with our attitudes. As the Roman soldier was putting on the belt, he was girding up his tunic, pulling up that tunic that hung down around his ankles and tucking it in his belt. This allowed him to move freely without this clothing tripping him up. But, just as importantly, as he did this, he was getting ready for war. Any apathy or indifference would be removed because the enemy was approaching and this was serious, so he was getting serious. And Paul says the same thing must happen with us. Before we put on the armor, we must deal with our attitudes. We must get rid of any indifference and apathy. See, if we don't care about fighting well, we won't fight well. So we have to see that we are facing a powerful enemy who wants to devour us. So this is serious business. So we've dealt with our attitude. Then we finished by looking at what the belt of truth was. We defined it. And it is the truth we learn as we dig into the scriptures. We could call it a well-rounded knowledge of biblical truth. And it's no accident this piece is put first. For the Roman soldier, the belt was put on first because it held the other pieces of armor in their proper place. Well, it's the same for us. Every other piece of spiritual armor is constructed and held in its proper position by the truth this belt is built from. So we put this piece on first, and that is done by knowing the truth. Now this week, we're going to put on the second piece of armor, the breastplate of righteousness. And we'll start by defining what this righteousness is, and then we'll see how it protects us. So let's define righteousness. There are three types of righteousness this verse could be speaking of. My own righteousness or self-righteousness that comes through my own efforts. Second one would be Christ righteousness that is given to me as a gift. That's called imputed righteousness. And then there would be the practical righteousness or sanctification. Theologically, this is called imparted righteousness. This is the work of the Spirit in us causing us to grow in holiness. In other words, a progressive becoming like Christ on a daily basis. Now, this is important, but it's not the focus of what this breastplate is about. So we'll leave this third type of righteousness for another study. So let's look at the first one I mentioned, self-righteousness, and we need to get rid of this right away. And let's begin by reminding ourselves of what Satan's goal is. It's to keep men and women from God and take them into hell. And one of his greatest deceptions, one of the easiest ways to do this, is to get men and women to think they're good enough on their own to make it into heaven. Thomas Adams, that great Puritan, said this, Self-righteousness is the devil's masterpiece. I can't tell you how many times I've heard things like this when I've been witnessing, where people will say, I'm not worried when I stand before God. You know, he knows I'm a decent person, that I never hurt people on purpose, that I love my family, I work hard, and I try to be honest. I mean, I even go to church and was thinking about serving in Sunday school. 
So you know what? I'll be fine on that day I stand before God. But the righteousness God requires is a perfect compliance to his moral law. It is living a sinless life. It is the life our Lord came to earth and lived for us. So while you may be great in man's eyes, you may be the cream of the crop. You fall short of God's standard. Romans 3.10 says this, As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. No one righteous, because, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we're not righteous. We're lawbreakers. We're guilty before God. We have all fallen short of what he requires to get into heaven. So if we're relying on our own goodness to escape hell and get into heaven, you know what? We are in big trouble, aren't we? God says no one is righteous. God says all have sinned and fall short of what is required to get into heaven. Now, this brings us to the next kind of righteousness, and this is what this verse is speaking about, and it's Christ's righteousness given to us, and this is called imputed or credited righteousness. Now, this righteousness is given to us as a free gift the moment we embrace Christ by faith. Romans 3, 21 and 22 says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. Now, how do we get it? Here it is, verse 22. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. See, when we trust in Christ, a great exchange takes place. Christ takes our sin and he gets what we deserve, which is the wrath of God against that sin. And we receive his righteousness and get what he earned, which includes acceptance with God and eternal life. From that point on, God begins to view us through Christ's perfection which means we stand before him with a clean record as if we have never sinned. Isaiah 1.18 says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Because of that, Paul can write Romans 8.1, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation for us because there is nothing left to condemn us over. The records are wiped clean, so there is nothing left to judge. Why? Because Christ paid the penalty for all my sin at the cross. Now think of this. If only one sin was left unpaid for, that would send me to hell. But there is no sin left unpaid. Therefore, we are secure. And here's the beauty of this. We are still secure even though we still fail. Why? Because my security is not based on my performance, is it? It is based on trusting in Christ's performance, what he did. And what did he do? He lived the perfect life. He never broke the law once. So he lived a righteous life, and that is given to me. And that is what God bases my eternity on. So to put on this breastplate of righteousness, we must understand it is constructed with the truth of imputed righteousness which is Christ's righteousness given to the sinner at the point of salvation. And the understanding, now this is important, and the understanding that for the believer who has placed their faith in Christ, God looks at Christ's performance and not our failures, and he accepts us because of that. Now, what attack does this breastplate, this understanding of imputed righteousness, defend us against? Well, it defends us against the devil's attempts to cause us to doubt we are saved. See, he wants to steal your assurance because of how it will affect your Christian experience. It will weaken you in the fight. I mean, how can you be strong if you are wondering if you are a child of God? How can you use the truth and promises provided as weapons if you're not sure they're for you? You can't. See, the devil wants to take away your ability to use the armor because the armor defeats him. This is why he works so hard to steal our assurance. He knows he can't stand against the truth and the promises of God. So his only hope is to keep you, to keep me from being able to use them. Plus, the believer who has this assurance will also have a joy that becomes attractive to the unbeliever. The devil can't have that, can he? A bunch of believers walking around secure and joy-filled, like a giant advertisement about how great it is to know Christ. He is going to do everything he can to stop that. And the piece of armor God has given us to defend us against that attack is the breastplate of righteousness. 
This will protect us against his schemes that are meant to cause doubt about our relationship with God. And let me remind you that we are exhorted to put on all the pieces of the armor. And just as the Roman soldier would never step onto the battlefield without his breastplate because of what it was designed to protect, I mean, it protected his vital organs, his heart, his lungs, his liver, his kidneys. So to enter into the battle without this would make him vulnerable to any spear thrust or stray arrow. More than likely, he would become a quick casualty. And it's the same for us. Enter the spiritual fight without putting this on, and you will experience defeat. Now, I'm not saying you won't go to heaven because you doubt your salvation. I am saying you won't enjoy the journey like you should, and I am saying that you will be weakened in the fight if you're not sure of your relationship with God. Well, let's continue on by looking at a couple of examples to see how this breastplate protects us. Well, first of all, the breastplate protects us by giving us assurance in times of failure. After we fail, what does the devil do? Now, we've all experienced this. He tries to use that failure to make us question our relationship with God, right? He wants to convince us that we can't be children of God and do something like that. So it's obvious we're going to end up in hell. But he can only do this if we are confused about how we are accepted by God. If we don't know how to put on the breastplate of righteousness, he is going to defeat us here. So please listen. You know how he tries to do this? He is going to try to get us to focus on our performance rather than Christ's perfection. He wants us to fixate on ourselves, which is going to magnify every failure, right? And then he uses those failures to just rip us apart, suggesting God can't love somebody like us. So stop fooling yourself, Bill. Somebody like you is never going to make it into heaven. See, he's called the accuser of the brethren in Revelation 12, and he is a master at taking our failures to beat us up with. How can you call yourself a Christian and think a thought like that? How can you call yourself a Christian when you have missed almost a week in your devotions? How can you call yourself a Christian when you just got so angry? Well, how do you answer that? How do we answer that? With the truth this breastplate is made up of, right? The devil roars at me, you can't be saved because of this or that. The truth of this breastplate allows me to answer, Satan, you are so right when you say my actions fall far short of what they should be. Man, I totally agree with you. I fail far too much. My love for God is far too weak. Plus, my commitment at times seems to be all over the place. But Satan, you know as well as I do that my acceptance with God is not based on any of that. It's based on trusting not in what I do for Christ, but in what he has done for me. He came and he lived a perfect life. So even though my performance may be pitiful at times, his never was. And you know what? God accepts me on the basis of his perfection and doesn't reject me because of my imperfection, because of my flaws. So case closed, clear off. I'm not guilty, but you know what? Hey, thank you for forcing me to think of this incredible truth and why I am so secure in Christ. And you know what? It makes me feel like worshiping for a while. So thank you. Now listen to Charity Bancroft put on the breastplate of righteousness in the great hymn before the throne of God above. This is wonderful. And as I read this to you, let it just wash over your soul. I'll read it, then we're going to tear it apart. Here it is. What though the accuser roar of ills that I have done, I know them well and thousands more. Jehovah findeth none. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him who pardoned me. I mean, that is incredible. That hymn is drenched in breathtaking theology, isn't it? Well, let's tear it apart. First verse, what though the accuser roar of ills that I have done, I know them well and thousands more. Jehovah findeth none. This is what we're talking about. The devil roars, reminding us of our sins. But you know what? He's not lying. He's right. He's right. And I could name so many more that he hasn't even mentioned. I know them well and thousands more, the song says. But now the good news. No, the incredible news. Jehovah findeth none. 
Satan won't forget them, and he tempts me to fixate on those sins, but God doesn't even see them anymore. They have been cleansed completely by the blood of Christ. The books in heaven are clean. They're blank. So based on that, let's move on to the next verse. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Isn't that good? Here's the solution. I don't look within. If I look at me, I have to agree with Satan. You know what? You're right. And that would lead me to despair and defeat. But I don't look at me at all. I lift my eyes to Christ who made an end to all my sin. All the guilt of my sin, past, present, and future, has been removed through the work of Christ. See, Satan wants me to focus on the ugliness of my performance, but the Bible says, no, look away to Christ and see the beauty of what he's done on your behalf. One more verse. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free, for God the just is satisfied to look on him who pardoned me. Because Christ died and paid for my sin, I'm free. Free from what? Free from any condemnation. Free from the threat of hell. Free from being victimized by Satan. Christ made an end to my sin, an end to my guilt, and this is true even though I still fail. My sinful soul is counted free. Why? Now here is the breastplate of righteousness being firmly put into place. For God the just is satisfied to look on him who pardoned me. I've sinned, and God who is holy and just cannot overlook it. He will not overlook it. That sin will be judged in one of two places, either on the Christ rejecter in hell for all of eternity or on Christ at the cross for everyone who believes. For them, God who is just is satisfied. Now get this. This is the good news of the gospel, and this is the breastplate of righteousness. For God the just is satisfied to look on him. Now get this. For God the just is satisfied to look on him who pardoned me. God looks upon the payment of Christ for my sins at the cross and declares me to be not guilty. And God looks at the righteous life of Christ who kept his law perfectly and is willing to accept his performance in my place. He gives me that righteousness. Now, let me say right here, if you don't know Christ today, you need to know that your sin cannot be overlooked by God. But he makes this incredible offer to you. I will judge that sin on my son at the cross instead of on you for eternity in hell, and I will give you his righteousness, that righteousness you need to get into heaven. My friends, that is a no-brainer, and I pray today will be the day of your salvation, the day you believe in God's Son and cry out to him for mercy and grace. If you acknowledge your sin and go to him, placing your faith in his Son, he will receive you and you will become his child. So Satan accuses us, trying to use our failures to convince us we are not children of God, we meet that attack with truth that tells us our acceptance with God is based on Christ's performance, not ours. And this is why the believer is secure even when they fail, because our acceptance with God hinges on the one who never failed once, who never sinned. Now get this, God looks at us through Christ's perfection and Christ's obedience, and he views us as if we had obeyed his law perfectly, and never sinned. Now, time for another song. I love singing these songs that are soaked in good theology. They strengthen my soul. This is from the great hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less, by Edward Moat. It says, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. The devil wants me to focus on sinking sand rather than the rock-solid stability of biblical truth. He knows the minute I look away from Christ's work to anything else, including my own performance, me especially to my own performance, I take off the breastplate that protects me against this attack, and I will be defeated and will sink into despair. So before we move on, let's close this up with a summary. We put on the breastplate of righteousness when we apply the truth of imputed righteousness to ourselves. Satan lies, you can't be a child of God because of what you did. We answer, I am a child of God because I trust in what he did. 
we beat back his assault with truth. So, this breastplate protects us after failure. Well, let's move to the second way the breastplate protects us. The breastplate protects us by giving us assurance in times of no feelings. I mean, we're so feeling-oriented, aren't we? And the devil knows how to use that when they are gone. See, he tries to convince us that they have more importance than they really have. And I'm not saying feelings aren't important, but Satan will try to elevate them to an inordinate position in our life, even to the point where we will use them to determine if we are still a child of God. So in those times our feelings are low, he will suggest, how can you be saved when you don't even feel God in your life? How can you be saved when you don't feel like reading your Bible today, praying or being around God's people? If you really were saved, wouldn't you be sure? Why do you have doubts that you're a child of God? What kind of relationship is that? Maybe it's not a relationship at all. What a liar this guy is. You don't need assurance of salvation to be saved. It's not based on that at all. What you need is faith alone in Christ alone. Many lack this assurance, but they're still going to heaven, right? My first big trial was when my feelings departed. I had this honeymoon period with Jesus that was simply amazing. He was so real in my life, and I was so in love. Then suddenly, nothing. All the feelings were gone, and the devil used that to convince me I wasn't saved, and I was miserable, and I was horrified. So I got into this performance treadmill, trying to merit God's love again, trying to get that feeling back, trying to earn the salvation I already had been given as a gift of grace based on what Christ did. I mean, this is a miserable way to live, isn't it? I was now afraid of the God I had fallen in love with, thinking he was just looking for that reason to kick me out of the family and cast me into hell. But fortunately, I've learned that dry times are normal and necessary for spiritual growth, that God will allow them to teach us not to depend upon the sinking sand of feelings. He wants to teach us to walk by faith, doesn't he? Because we'll never be stable until we learn that. But faith in what? Well, now we're back to the truth provided by the breastplate of righteousness. We must base our Christianity upon biblical facts that tell us it doesn't matter how we feel. We're saved because Christ's righteousness was given to us at the point of faith, and that doesn't change one bit even when our feelings and emotions are bone dry. Now, this is great news, isn't it, for people like you and I? You know, people with normal feelings that go up and down. I mean, today I love God, but tomorrow I feel a bit indifferent. One day I think Christianity is the greatest thing ever. Other times it seems, you know, just a bit boring, a bit routine maybe. And you know, it's interesting when I've said things like that from the pulpit, people are shocked. And I think, why? Because I'm a pastor? No, I'm just like you. My feelings go up and down just like yours do. They leave and then they come back. But here's the thing. I've learned not to base anything on them. I mean, if I judged anything by my feelings, I'd be a nutcase, tossed to and fro, unstable as water. So I love it when my feelings are gushing, when I'm thrilled about everything, but I don't panic when they aren't. You know what? I know they'll be back. So we just keep doing the right thing, right? We still pick up our Bible and read it. We still pray. We still go to church and enjoy fellowship with other believers. We still do all those things that lead to a healthy spiritual life, whether we feel like it or not. Because, you know, I know this. If I stop being disciplined, if I stop those things that make me spiritually healthy, those feelings might not return. So I just keep seeking God, and I know eventually the feelings come back, and I know eventually they'll go again. I mean, it's up and down with feelings, isn't it? So what have we seen? We put the breastplate on when we rest in the truth of what Christ has done for us, his work. When we rest in the fact that God has placed the righteousness of Christ into our account, and that doesn't change when we have failed or when we don't have any feelings. And let me just add one more theological word that tells us what has happened when God puts the righteousness of Christ into our account. I really want to hammer this home. It's so important, isn't it? The Bible says when we believe in Christ that we are justified. Now, justification is one of those great biblical theological words. It's a legal word that means to be declared not guilty by the judge. And again, that doesn't change just because our feelings do. Whether I feel forgiven or whether I don't, it doesn't matter one bit. The Bible says I am forgiven. 
Uh, that's a fact because of what Christ has done and because of what God the Father has done. See, my forgiveness is not up for debate. So let's conclude this. The breastplate of righteousness. This is the piece of armor that protects us against the temptation to doubt our salvation. And we saw it provides assurance in times of failure, and in those times we lack spiritual feelings. Then the beauty of understanding this truth is what inspires us to live for Christ, that third way of righteousness, that practical day-to-day -day sanctification, as I see what God has done for me. I want to glorify Him with my life. I want to live for Him, and I want to worship Him with my actions. Well, thanks everyone for being here. Thank you for your kind comments and telling me how you pray for me. You know, I feel it and can't tell you how much I appreciate it. My desire is to finish my life well, to run across the finish line, getting the truth out as much as we can. So thank you for praying. I love you guys. I mean, the Footnote family, you guys are just awesome. So I'll see you in the next video as we look at the spiritual shoes we need to put on. God bless you guys.